I grew up probably about, and I'm, I'm going by, you know, when I think of Miles as a, as a child in my memory, we, we went by horse and wagon everywhere. So, you know, my sense of distance, even when I know better, I still, you, you know, think of that. But I would say it would be about 20 miles, 25 miles west of there. I live not far from the National Park border, so uh, I was west in, um, not west, east of, let's see, I got a thing, now Deb, uh, Big River is north mm -hmm. and south, Debden, so I lived east of, uh, uh, east of, uh, of the, of Dumble, mm -hmm. at a place called Park Valley. And in the, in the old days, the name of, of Park Valley, the, our name for it, was Nakiwin. And Nakiwin means the stopping place. And from what my father told me and, and, and the old people, that uh, our family was one of the first families, and as far as I know, the first family that was there that came to Park Valley. It was uh, all forest when when uh, we came there and um, the trail that goes from Park Valley to Debden was known as the Campbell Trail originally because my grandfather had, had uh, helped to cut it and I don't know at what point that uh, that settlers started to move there I don't know how old I was because I can't remember that but I do uh, remember people coming you know we had a lot of uh, people who were eventually became our relatives and were probably our relatives way back, uh, Métis people who came from Willow Bunch area and, and from Round Prairie, which is not far from uh, Saskatoon, who came and, and, and joined our family. And the Shorts, I believe, were the first people that came to our area. And, and they came from Round Prairie and Willow Bunch originally, I think, from Willow Bunch to Round Prairie too. But that was a whole... Uh, a whole area that uh, that uh, Métis people wintered. Um, they were buffalo hunters, and it was the area where their relatives, uh, the Cree people, Woodland Cree, came from that whole thick wood hills area and into into the what's today called the Ladder Hills. So the the history that I know, the oral history, is uh, was was from my great-grandmother, my, my father, and a lot of the old people that that I grew up with. What about, they call it the Ladder Hills? It's called the Ladder Hills. Um, when my great-grandmother talked about those hills, she called, she always called them Xenio Spatnawa, which means Old Man Hills. And um, um, I don't know if there was another name for them in Cree, but that was what she called them in and my great grandmother came from the. Her people were the Mas, uh, Masescapos from, from the, uh, uh, what became the, the Ataka group or the, the, Sandy Lake First Nations. Where did you go to school? I went to school in in Park Valley. They 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 had a one room school, about um, two miles, two miles east of uh, east of. Um, of, uh, of, of the southeast, I have a hard time with with direction from uh, from the Park Valley. What used to be the Park Valley store? What what was it like for the the social life there? Um, well, our social life was within our community with our own people, um, and then we had a you know my memories of it are really are really rich and, and strong. Uh, there was a lot of, of Métis people that lived, uh, Métis and half-breed people, and I say half-breed people because that, those were the Scottish-English half-breeds. Uh, the, the French were the, the Métis people. So um, they lived all the way from Debden, and between Debden and Big River on, on that east side and the... And the uh, you know, the road that goes from Debden to Big River on both sides of that road, there were there were little uh, road lounges. Um, you couldn't really call them communities because they were more family, 
family units. We lived in family groups. And also in the area where I come from, there were road lounge communities. And originally, uh, many of the people uh, had homesteads. Well, originally they had script, Métis script, and then uh, those scripts were either stolen or uh, taken from them. Um, a couple of families sold them because they, they needed money. And then some of the families, after after losing their script, when, when the land was open for homesteading, some of the families took homesteads. Um, and those are families like, I believe, the Goodries and the Shorts and, uh, and uh, Arkans and people like that. Not all of them, but many of them did. And many of them who had homesteads lost their homesteads because they just didn't have the means to to uh, to work the land, you know, they didn't have money, they were really poor. Have you been up there recently? To see what I go home every summer because we have, you know, the church is there and that's where my family is, is buried. And uh, the church is behind what used to be the old cheese factory there. Mm -hmm. There used to be a cheese factory, a store, and and, and a little cluster of, uh, of, the, of the man who owned the store, his family that lived there, and, and uh, the old man who, whose son ran the store had the cheese factory. We always thought they were French because they said they were, and found out that uh, when I was doing research at the Round Prairie Métis settlement that, uh, that, that they, were, they were Métis. They were French Métis, yeah. but they, they always said they were French. You know, there, were, there was some discussion at some point that some people from from the Real Rebellion area, from the from the uh, Batash, uh, went up there as well. Is that? Well, that's true. Most of the many of the Métis families uh, that ended up there um, were families who had been involved in the, in the battle, and they they fled mm -hmm. uh, to that area where the Prince Albert National Park is because that was that was um, their wintering sites were there, but also they had. Uh, there were Cree relatives who were, these were all people that hunted buffalo in the, the summer. They were related to people in those areas, like their, their, in their Cree families were there and they joined them because that was all, that was all forest area. There was nobody there except for the, for the indigenous people that lived there. My family uh, on my grand, great grandmother's side were, uh, were Cree people. They were they were Cree Métis. They weren't full blood Cree. Yeah. You know, we talk about the forest, and people refer to the forest. And today, of course, there's a whole concern over the forest being clear cut. The forest was part of the economy then as well. To keep um, in the early days, the economy wasn't. Uh, we we weren't the people who who uh, were loggers, but we worked for loggers. That whole area of Park Valley, the old stories from the old people, was that it had old growth forest. And, um, and my father used to say that the trees were, were so huge. And his, his father, um, uh, was, was one of the people that worked there, said that the trees were so big that uh, three men could put their arm around, like mm -hmm. standing together, could, could just barely get around that tree. He said the trees were huge all in through. Now I can't speak for Dumble area because the stories I have about that were in, in my area. But uh, in the Dumble, all of that area between, I would say from Dumble all the way to Big River and, and north, points north, and then toward the park uh, was, was logged out pretty well. There was lots of logging that was done. And uh, there, were, there were people who had small logging companies, like family logging companies, and they'd hire local people. And uh, my, my family were some of the people that worked in logging. And um, lots of uh, lumber, like they cut logs for lumber, and like they had sawmills. I'm just trying to remember some of the families that they were, I think Scandinavian, the, the, the ones in my area, I don't know what they would have been. Um, more toward the Big River area, but I'm sure there must be local histories that were written. I know in the 19 in the 1960s there was a whole series of uh, oral story projects that were done in that area. I was in the in the archives digging around when I was 
when I was working on my uh, uh, my master's and I wanted to do a, a history of, of the area and I was doing research, I came across um, a whole box of interviews that had been done in the Park Valley um, uh, Lake Four uh, to, to, uh, to um, you know, the edges of uh, Dumble and, mm -hmm. and, and that way from the Big River Road, the highway east toward the park, but mostly in my area, that road that goes from uh, from Debden that comes to Park Valley and through Lake Four and comes out at what's the name of the, oh my gosh, my COVID memory, but uh, where the festival is. Ness Creek. Uh, Ness Creek. The road comes out at Ness Creek. Uh, that used to be the, uh, you know, that was the other road, the Big River Debden Road and then this road. And, and there were settlements of Métis people, these family groups all through there. And so that, that round, a round trip, we could pretty well visit. We knew everybody, that, and some of those people were family, or we had married into those families. And you know, with, with growing up there in your experience, how much of that impacted on your what you've done since then in terms of your writing and Well, that's where all of that's, and, that's, 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 that's my... That's my my treasure chest. I mean, that, that was a very, uh, it was an, an area that was rich in oral tradition. It was rich in a, in a, in a, in a, in a land culture. Um, it was rich in language. It, it had everything except that there was no work for our people. There was nothing because, as I said, our people were, were buffalo hunters and they were independent. They, they were... Um, they were the people that were called the Bemsuak, that means the free people. So we didn't belong to a parish or a fort or anything. Originally the families were buffalo hunters and they they would make that trek um, all the way into the, you know, from, from there, come to Round Prairie and meet up with other buffalo hunters and, and make these expeditions all the way into Montana through Judith Basin and end up at Pemina and then come back all the way around. That was done twice a year. This is was back in the in those days when they were still doing buffalo hunting. And they were families who had fled from Batash, many of them, and had been really involved there, but were scared they were going to be hanged. They were they ran away from the soldiers and so there's there's a lot of history and and, and a lot of um, of their families you know, their great-grandfathers had been involved in, in the battle at Batoche. Um, I know that uh, the Vandal family, which is my, my uh, on my grandmother's side, um, and they lived, some of them lived around Dumble and Bodmin in that area. They, um, their families, uh, the, the great -grand our great-grandfather on that side had been, had been uh, a part of the battle at Batoche. And uh, my mother's family on the Morset side, which is the family that Jesse, Jesse um, Thistle comes from, that was uh, they were also involved in the battle at Batash. Those those families, they were the Montours and and other families that they were related to, and and so there's lots of really rich oral stories in in that community and. And I'm I'm 82, so I mean I I was really privileged to growing up with those stories. It got really uh, bad as we got older, the community, because we were landless people to start with. We had been, you know, that was our traditional territories, uh, and the traditional territory for sure of our our grandmother's people. But you know, once settlement started, it was there was a big huge move to get people off of the land. And uh, and that was done in all sorts of ways. So it was kind of like you can't really blame it on one thing because it was a whole lot of a whole lot of things. Just like today, it's never done with one thing. It you know you're when you dispossess people, you come at them from from all angles and all sorts of ways. But poverty was was certainly one of the main things because there was no work. Once all of the roots and the rocks and the you know, the the land had been cleared because they worked for settlers to clear the land. Once all of that was done, there was there was no place for us. And and 
you know, after buffalo hunting, people had been trappers and hunters and they couldn't do that anymore because the land was settled and you just couldn't go hunting wherever you wanted. So there was, there was not very much. And, and in those days, there was no such thing as welfare or anything like that. So people, you know, uh, again, I, I feel really privileged because I come from people who were independent and worked hard. You know, when settlers say they worked hard, uh, believe me, Métis, Métis Road Lounge communities worked hard to survive. And, and remembering what um, a road lounge is, is you, there's this continual moving. So a lot of Métis people who lived on road allowances would stay maybe in Dumble for a couple of years and they'd move to Park Valley for a couple of years. That way you can kind of keep the authorities away. Yeah? And it was also a way that you would just go from family to family and, and, um, and help. And you might have family that homesteaded, you know, they had land. But that didn't mean that you had land. You know, there are examples, and I won't name families, but there are families in that whole area between Park Valley and, and Dumble area, that, that whole area, where there were people who lived in small groups in road allowances, but they might have a family member that, that had a homestead there. And so, you know, they would stay close to relatives. There was a, a, a story of a, of a ghost herd of buffalo. Mm hmm I know that, that, that was, and I don't know if it's the same herd, but this is going way back to whenever the, when buffalo were first put into that park, that uh, there were some people from our community and from a couple of other communities that cut the, the wire and let let those go because mm -hmm. I said these were old buffalo hunters and yeah. and buffalo shouldn't be be kept. But at the same time, you know, when you look at the history of, of buffalo in pens, uh, it was also a Métis man who fought really hard and long to make sure that buffalo were preserved and, and worked and negotiated with government to do that. And somebody is now working on, on publishing a book of his history. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just, I, I'll think of his name before we get finished, but I can't think you know, of it right now. Wait, I just want to go back to something. When you, when you think of the, the past being related, of course, to, to tree cutting, to cutting for, for logging, and now you have these large companies coming in, and they, they want to really do a major clear cut. Mm -hmm. what, what's the difference between Well, I think the difference, I mean, when I think of it, I... You know, but I, at the same time, I also believe that we need to acknowledge our history. Um, the people who who had small, you know, they they logged with horses and they had sawmills. If it started out with clearing the land, people, you know, settlers came and had to clear their land. But because the trees were so rich, a lot of uh, people set up these sawmills. So it was, it was a way of earning a, a living, usually for a family, and they would hire local people to, to do logging. And it was some of the work that my family did. And I think uh, it was either Erickson's or Swanson's, I can't remember, who had a small sawmill, and my family, my dad and my uncles would go in and work there sometime. I think that's who they were, but they were Scandinavian people who lived along the Sturgeon River. One of them had a sawmill in that area. Now, if he had a sawmill much later, I can't remember, but he did have a sawmill when I was a little girl. Um, and I remember that because he lost his arm, or his son lost his arm in the, in the sawmill, so I, I never forgot that. Mm. And I must have been probably about four, three or four when because I barely remember it. But it was, uh, people were, were earning a living. It was, you know, like uh, gardening, you know, except that uh, the, the big trees got clear cut and those were bigger logging companies that came and did that. And I, I know that I saw all of the photographs in the archives, uh, photographs of those big trees and, 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 uh, and logging companies but they were again with done the logging was done with horses and that's the same kind of logging that was done in BC except they were they were, it was much bigger industry and and 
you know, from there, many of those people, they hunted and trapped. They worked for settlers picking rocks and stones and brushing. But they also would work as loggers. Yeah? So for my people, it was part of the work that we did to survive. And, and for the people who had logging, uh, little logging businesses, those were settlers and they were people that were earning a, you know, making a, a family income, a small income. Big difference from corporations who have, who don't, you know, the community is of no importance to them and, and um, you know, and they're, and they're just cutting they're cutting, you know, where the old kind of logging, according to my dad, was like harvesting. You didn't mm -hmm. go out and clear cut. You you selected your land because you had to think about, you know, that land 10 years from now, you were going to live there. So the only land that was clear cut was the land that they were going to, that they were going to farm. So they would clear cut that and then our people would come along and they'd do the stumping and and um, and cutting of the brush that was... You know that was there, and then the land would be would be seeded. But even that didn't really happen. They didn't hire a lot of people until um, probably in the in the 1930s because there just wasn't uh, you know nobody had money. Settlers when they first came didn't have much money, so any hiring that was done was an exchange of work for you know for uh, food, grain, things like that. It was always in the beginning exchanges, which was, uh, you know, created a different kind of relationship when when people exchange uh, their, their, their labor. Because um, I remember my, my dad again and my, my family telling me about um, trading with, with the local farmer or the local settler who would grind, he would grind grain to feed his animals and, and, and use it for flour and, and porridge or whatever, you know, like they ate for breakfast food. And, and our, our family cutting brush for him to trade so that we'd have enough flour and, and, um, and grain, you know, grains to eat until, uh, you know, over the winter. So lots of trades were made in the early days. And then once people started to hire then the relationship again the relationship you know between indigenous community and and settler community changed and then once it became uh, you know the big farms or bigger farmers came and then it it totally changed Where are the voices to guide us through these times the more that i look i see one